Uh, to start the forum, uh, it would be great if each of you uh, could take a few minutes to provide an overview of your library's experience uh, leaving a big deal. Um, you know, which deals did you leave? What were your driving motivations? And what has the outcome been um, so far? Just a, a brief uh, overview. I know we'll dive into this more in detail and uh, follow up questions, but perhaps we you know, could start in the order of introductions. On, uh, and if you could kick us off. Sure. I have to do the dreaded unmute. So here I am. I remembered to unmute. Ann Langley, UConn Library. Before I dive in, I want to give a huge shout out to all of my colleagues at UConn Library who did incredible work uh, carrying out my idea to save us a whole lot of money. And also all of our faculty and administrative partners at the university who also were incredible supporters and had amazing ideas. So shout out to all of them. So the the reason we uh, unbundled all of our big deals at UConn over the course of we're actually in our final year and a half um, is really about budget. So budget drove all of our decisions to do this. We UConn, as many people know, has lots of budgetary issues over the years. Uh, we've cut a lot of fact, a lot of staff positions, all kinds of stuff. But in 2019, December of 2019, we were looking at serious two and a half, three million dollar cuts to our budget, and I could no longer take it in staff. We'd gone from 166 staff in 2012 to 100 in 2018 when I got there and there was just no wiggle room. Um, and so really thinking hard about this and having experienced journal cancellations from the beginning of my career in 1996 at multiple institutions, I was ready to just say, we're done, we're getting out. We have, we have the software technology to make it easy for people. We'll figure it out. Let's come up with a plan. Let's not break any contracts. When they come up for renewal, we'll just end them. And uh, so that was our plan. So we had to cut between two and a half and three million dollars from our collections budget. And I didn't want to do the death by a thousand cuts. So it was like, let's just do it. Let's do it. Um, and then uh, so we did. We, we had a couple, you'll hear a lot about this later, but we had a internal external groups that worked on it. We got university administration involved. Um, and we also, our goal was really save money, save time, get people what they need. That was really our focus. Um, and uh, right now um, we are down to about, we had a four and a half million dollar e-journal spend and we're down to about 2 million now. By 2025, we'll be at 1.5. And we're spending between 150 and 300K providing articles on demand. So that's a huge difference. And people are getting what they need when they need it super fast. Um, I think the hardest part to, to do something like this is PR. You have to pay attention to PR. The rest of it, librarians can figure anything out. But if you don't have your PR in place, your communication plan in place, your admin in, in place, it's not going to happen well. Um, and I think that that role of the university administration is key. And I'm going to stop there because I think I answered all the questions you wanted me to cover. Thanks so much, Anne. Uh, Parham, if you'd like to go next. Thanks, Nick. And, and thanks for hosting this uh, important conversation. So I'm uh, Param Bedi. I'm the vice president for the uh, library and information technology here at Bucknell. Um, so at Bucknell, uh, we are a merged uh, library and, uh, and uh, IT organization. So I lead both those teams. And I've been here for um, about in my 17th year um, in this role. So just as a backdrop about um, why we are all here today. So we actually started this conversation in the fall of 2019 with a faculty governance group. and. And it kind of came about uh, as we, I was do developing a five-year projection of what our budgets are, because our budgets were staying flat. We were not getting um, any uh, additional funds. Uh, and that was university-wide. I mean, the library was not singled out. I mean, you know, everybody was kind of had to deal with a flat budget. So as we were kind of making these projections, I just had to share that one chart with the faculty governance group saying, this is what the deficit looks like in the next five years if you don't start taking action now. And looking back, I think that was the single most 
it, a piece of information that kind of got this conversation started. And they looked at it like, okay, now what are we going to do? And for us, um, when we kind of started this conversation, it was not about cutting uh, budget, cutting budgets. It was about really um, sustainability. And, and that's the way we kind of frame the conversation on campus. And the task force that we formed, we called it the Collection Development Sustainability Task Force. And, and we were really intentional about not focusing so much on, on the budget, but about the experience. Um, so we here have a little over 400 faculty at Bucknell. And what we were finding was every year, uh, we have we ha hired anywhere from 40 to 60 faculty. I mean, no, they are not all new lines, but a lot of visiting faculty that are coming in, uh, filling in for sabbaticals or uh, uh, folks who are on leave. And obviously they're, they're here for a year or two. And we had no room in our budget to kind of take into account any new programs that we were starting, any new faculty requests that were any new courses. We were like, well, there's no money in the budget to do any of those things. So I think we we kind of really looked at how do we kind of sustain and look at things five, 10, 15 years out? Um, and, and how do we kind of form that experience? Uh, another example was in 2017, we, we launched a brand new college of management, but we have nothing in the library that could support that new college. To, and, and, and so we, um, kind of really stepped back and looked at, okay, we need a different model on how we do this. So we started looking at um, uh, really kind of working with a, a, a really fantastic faculty committee that we have, uh, it's called CLEAR, and uh, uh, with the academic administration, the provost, the college deans. And like I mentioned, so we've, uh, I formed a, a a task force which included librarians uh, and also uh, since we're a merged organization i actually had my it project manager lead this project because we needed strong project management in this and so she was a real champion of not just project management but also managing the change on campus so the two most important things we learned through this process was change management and project management i think everything else Kind of, if you have those foundations, everything else kind of falls into place. Uh, and we started this actually process, believe it or not, in the spring of 2020, uh, as the world was shutting down. But we kind of continued to keep our going, and we had faculty uh, representation on a on a task force. And it was kind of really. Um, meeting with all different groups, answering questions, because there was so much um, misconception about what we were doing. Oh, this is about you cutting things. Uh, I'm not gonna have access to what I need. So once we kind of addressed all those questions, I think the conversation really changed. I mean, I remember going to um, uh, a meeting of the, of the uh, department chairs for the College of Arts and Sciences, there are about 45 of those. And after we presented what we were doing, Actually, people started clapping. Yes, we are all behind you, and and why we're we doing this, and and so, um, and one of the things I said early on, which really kind of made a difference, was we are not taking access away. You are still going to have access to what you have today, and you'll have access to more things. You we don't have access to today because we don't have the resources to get them, and you might not have immediate access, but you'll have it. In a, in a short time frame. I think kind of really uh, debunking some of those myths that people have about when you say you're taking something away, I think that really shifted the conversation and then got the faculty buy-in. And and, um, and uh, I think you probably read in the in, in the in the write-up that Spark did, we, when we kind of made the change in January um, of 23, I was expecting like I, my email box is gonna blow up it's been over two years and I haven't received a single email from any faculty member saying what, what, what we did was not right. So I'll stop there. It's a great note to end on. Uh, already seeing themes emerging. Um, yeah, Stephanie, I'd like to go next. 
Yes, for us, uh, the, the whole adventure was driven by a large budget cuts uh, on our uh, acquisition budget. Uh, the, the cut was of $1.75 million uh, out of uh, an acquisition budget of 10 million at that time. So, and it's 10 years ago. So <laughs> it's a long story. It, it goes back uh, in time. Uh, so it forced us to consider drastic, drastic measures. Uh, so we decided to attack to those very heavy pieces of our budget, the, 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 big, the big deals. Um, we began our first unbundling uh, of Wiley uh, only because uh, it was the next to be re re renewed. Uh, and we did an analysis of Wiley's title inspired by the California Digital Library methodology at that time, 20, 10, years, 10 years ago, and, uh, and we, we, we broke the first deal. But we soon received very thoughtful comments from our community, not, uh, not about the, the idea of missing title, but about the methodology. <laughs> that was the, the, the main focus. Um, they were supportive of, of big deals on, on bundling idea. So what we did is to, to gather a, a task force of those faculty that have been the more critics of our methodology. Uh, there were faculty members, students, uh, and we uh, we created a group that group to improve the methodology, and we had the help of a, a library school and bibliometric uh, teacher, Vincent Larivière, who now holds the new uh, UNESCO chair of uh, Open Science. So it, it was pretty strong committee. It was really interesting to hear them th think about uh, the, the methodology. So uh, they did recommendation, and I may talk about those recommendations la la later to enhance and adapt the methodology. And we built a powerful analytical tool uh, with where we could find usage stats, citation, results of a survey that we did, availability through uh, of those sources through uh, OA uh, sources or, or archive that we have bought. Uh, so at the end, uh, uh, we ident out of a, a total collection of uh, 50,000 uh, journals, we identified 5,000 ti ti uh, titles that were really essential for our community, so 10% only. And it really gives us an uh, interesting idea of where we, we had to, with, with which uh, um, uh, commercial publisher we had to focus. Uh, and then we established a formula um, uh, to identify the fair price we were going to uh, uh, attribute to each of the big deals. So it was the amount that we were going to to be that, that was going to be available to each of the negotiations. So at the end, to to, to be rapid, at the end we unbundled um, Wiley, Springer, Taylor, and Francis. Uh, and uh, we only do did a title by title with them for some essential title, and for all I would say all the other big deals and small deals, we renegotiated everything with the methodology, with the results, with the the mind of this fair price we attributed to each of the 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 sources. So it was really intensive <laughs> for our acquisition team, but we have been able to. Uh, to 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 have uh, the, the to to reach the amount of, of budget cuts that we had to do, I will say there. Wonderful, uh, thank you much, so much, Stephanie and uh, uh, Chris. If you want to, I go next for for MIT to round us out. Yeah, thanks so much, and and thanks to to Spark and ACRL for hosting this and. And uh, it's really great to hear other people's experience. And I really appreciate uh, Anne and others who, who, who kind of lead with local context matters so much. And um, uh, yeah, I'm really struck anew by that. Our local context at MIT, oh, I'm Chris Berg. I'm the director of libraries at MIT. Um, our local context at MIT is different in a lot of ways. Um, one particular way uh, that sort of is, um, uh, sort of an overarching theme that impacts the story that, that I'm going to tell today is um, that MIT is a place that has, as an institution, 
has a long history of supporting open and having openness as a, like a core part of the culture. Like, you know, we are one of the birthplaces of open source software, open courseware, you know, started 20 some odd years ago. One of the first uh, all campus OA policies in the US. So like long, long history of open that is really a part of the culture. Um, so, so the story that I wanna talk about for us is very specific to our decision in June 2020 to, to cease negotiations with Elsevier. And since June of 2020, we have had no journals contract with Elsevier. So that's, it's not an, un, we've unbundled some other things. We've, you know, tried to avoid big deals for quite some time. Um, up until June, 2020, we had a already had a title by title deal with Elsevier. And in June 2020, after trying very hard to negotiate with them, uh, we're not able to reach an agreement um, and walk away. That was prompted not by budget considerations. Again, another real difference here. Um, it was prompted by um, a set of principles that grew out of a process that was several years long. So and, and I'm not even going to tell the whole story because that'll take too long. But let's start in 2019. In 2019, uh, a group, uh, an institute-wide open access task force um, released a set of recommendations, one of which was that, the, the, that MIT should develop a set of principles to be ratified by the faculty about open scholarship. Now, it turns out ratifying a set of principles at the faculty level. I don't know how that would work on your campus. It's really hard and we never got around to that. True, true story. But we did in the committee on the libraries decide to take that to a very specific level and develop what a set of principles for negotiating with commercial publishers. And that's the MIT framework that many of you endorsed at the time. Thank you very much. And uh, it may well be uh, familiar with. Um, and the, that set of principles, um, you know, many uh, sort of grounded in this idea that uh, a principle that authors should not have to give up rights to their own work. Authors should not have to waive their own institutions, policies or funder policies in order to publish. Right. So there were some real very clear principles in that framework. Um, uh, that supported, you know, a move towards more openness um, in scholar communications and for the publications coming out of MIT. And we started there, again, wasn't about budget for us. Um, it was about the fact that, again, there's, there was, there was a, a fairly widespread consensus across campus that open is good. Um, we had an open access policy and and a, a task force that was tasked with, you know, coming up with recommendations about how we could be even more open, right? And so, so the framework and then the, that being the lever to walk away from Elsevier was about where does the, where does the Institute have um, uh, a, a lever with publishers to make a difference that isn't scholar by scholar. Like the only place that MIT is at the table with the publishers is through the library. And so in addition, you know, instead of or in addition to negotiating prices for reading, that's where we can start to talk about principles for publication as well. And so that's so, okay, long story short, and I, the, the other questions will get there, but the, it was a year long, years long process of developing these principles in collaborate, close collaboration with faculty and others, socializing those principles, getting buy-in for those principles, uh, collecting allies and building coalition across campus and support of the, uh, the institution. So that by the time we got to the point where it was clear that Elsevier was not going to offer a contract that met the principles, all I had to do, I mean, all I had to do at that point, we just had to say, look, they wouldn't, they wouldn't meet these principles and hear where they fell short. And, you know, I had faculty and, and leaders across the institute say, well, you got to stick to your principles. So that's our story. It's a little different, but a lot of similarities as well. And, and like Anne, 
uh, you know, I, Aaron's here to keep me honest and to fill in some details at certain points. Um, but truly, there were so many people across the libraries and across MIT who put in years of work, lots and lots of work, and frankly, um, who uh, it displayed a significant amount of bravery in taking this stance. And so big shout out to that, to, to everyone across the libraries and the Institute who, who helped make this happen. Thanks so much for those uh, those intros and on sort of that note of appreciation too. It was really an impossible you know sort of choice on like who to profile, like in what order, you know, sort of uh, you know who to have join these panels. I mean, I think we need to be doing more of these, but you know, I just want to flag the um, cancellation tracker that I mentioned at the top. Um, you know, just also by way of recognizing the other institutions that have you know sort of put in the the difficult work here and also have really valuable experiences to to share. So you know we'll uh, dive into you know sort of a discussion with this panel, but just wanted to at the top make sure to highlight you know the many many other institutions, many of whom are probably here in the room, um, you know that have this kind of experience and have done this this important um, and sometimes challenging work. You know, so already uh, sort of the theme of faculty reactions uh, has come uh, to the forefront, you know, pretty unsurprising, uh, I think. But, you know, in speaking with many libraries through our negotiations community practice uh, that are considering these moves or, you know, speaking to them before um, they made the decision to leave a deal or unbundle, um, you know, the, the reaction of faculty or potential reaction to uh, a change like this just frequently come up as you know, a barrier uh, for even proceeding um, down down this path. Um, you know, and I think, and since UConn uh, you know, announced plans not just to leave one or even a couple or a few big deals, but to systematically unbundle from all of them, uh, uh, I think it'd be great to start with you just to hear a little bit more about um, you know, what you've already started to share about you know, sort of faculty's reaction to this systematic move. Um, you know, sort of how you got there. Absolutely. So um, let me pull up my notes here. Um, as I said in my intro, the hardest piece is PR, getting buy-in, getting people to understand what's actually going on. And I think that that once you gain the support of administration, and I think it really helps if you also include them in the work that you do. For example, we had an internal a group that looked at the logistics, but then an external group of 40 faculty who we pulled together, the provost and I were co-hosts of this. It was called Future of Journals. And we met, this was during, um, uh, from December, 2021 through March of 2021, um, for uh, like multiple weeks, maybe nine weeks, once a week we met and we had a, a Google doc where we just answered questions, added questions, expanded on them in the meetings. But we had what I would call 40 champions, faculty champions from across the university, from health sciences to uh, to medieval studies, um, every single field. And um, we asked, we also had some postdocs in the room and all of my senior leadership team were ex officios as well as our head of acquisitions. And basically what we did was we educated all of them about the situation. And then we asked them what would be the parameters to make this work for you. And they basically came up with two, easy to find, quick return. That was all they cared about. If they could find it easily through their own discovery that we already had in place, Google Scholar, any of our databases, and they could get it within three minutes, they were fine with it. And then at the end of all of that, after we'd answered all of their questions over those months, we held a vote. Can we do this project? And it was unanimous, unanimous, no questions, because we'd spent all that time educating them, hearing from them, teaching them about OA, scholarly communication, serials crisis, every single thing you could possibly imagine, and why we were doing it to save money. And one of the most powerful things the provost said was, we don't have to do this project, but I have to find $4 million to cut. Shall we cut your department? And that was a real, that was the provost said that to the committee and it was real eye-opening. Like this is a real thing. This is gonna happen. And so then um, that was the hardest part, right? But actually 
it was the easiest part because we took the time to help them understand the situation. And then those people became our champions. And that was amazing. So uh, long story short, we did all the background work. We found Article Galaxy Scholar. We got used Unsub. We you know, started on our project. We had open meetings. We met with deans. We met with administrators. We met with any department or school or college that wanted us to meet with them. The provost got so excited. He was demoing the interaction and things. It was like, oh my God, the provost is conducting bibliographic <laughs> instruction. It was hilarious. But that buy-in was phenomenal, right? Because as people would say, why do you need the provost? Well, I don't choose my budget. The money comes from them. I don't really care what journals we subscribe to. If it all comes down to it, I'm not using them. I know it's my responsibility to provide, provide them with people, but the limitation is the budget and it comes from above. So they have to hold themselves accountable. So we also had uh, an email that many people, myself, our communications person, head of acquisitions, it was, I think it was like journals questions at uconn.edu, um, that anyone could ask a question about anything about the process. I would say we averaged one email a week every time for like three weeks, every time we unbundled from another publisher. And there were only about five faculty of all 9,000 or however many we have at UConn, there were five faculty who were angry as hell. That's it, five. And we just, mostly what we said to them was, here are your colleagues. They served on the committee. Please talk to them. But also, this is the situation. We're spending $400,000 where we used to spend $4 million or whatever the number is. And, and it was hard to refute that. So it was really only five people because a lot of times the seamless, it was a seamless switch over. Uh, the Dean of the graduate school um, was talking to me. He was totally behind this process. And we had just uh, canceled or unbundled from or uncontracted from Sage. And uh, he was like, so when, are you, when is Sage on the list? And I said, oh, we did it last year. And he said, I didn't even notice. Most people, and I think, I think it was Param that said this, um, or Stephanie, most people didn't even notice that, the, that because of the way we designed it, it was just another click on a citation that you would discover that would only show up if you were faculty. And so most people didn't even notice that we unbundled. It was all behind the scenes. They were just getting what they wanted when they needed it. Plus, instead of a three minute turnaround, 97% of the time in 10 seconds, it appears in your email in 10 seconds. So how do you argue with that? You can't argue with it. So I would say, making sure that you're getting people what they need, you find out the parameters of what their requirements are, to do their work well and then make it happen and make sure you have talked to all the right people and you have champions. I'm going to stop there. Amazing. Stephanie, I know uh, Montreal's experience was similar in a way, just in you know, unbundling from a number of uh, deals in relatively quick succession. Um, so if one of you could go next and sort of speaking to that, that faculty reaction component and managing and preparing for it. Yes, there's a lot of similarities between the reaction of my, my communities and Anne's community. Uh, and I think it's because of the same thing. We put a lot of energy in our communication. So we we really we uh, we we did all we can to mobilize the faculty, students, uh, head of departments, uh, university officer. We we wrote article to explain what was happening, why the whole ecosystem of of of, uh, of scholarly publication. We did meeting with, with departments, presentation. We built a website. Uh, we uh, we uh, were we explained them the the oligo oligopolistic situation we were uh, uh, facing uh, the the budget uh, situation we were facing and when we were meeting with uh, faculty we were always accompanied by Vincent La Rivière so it was really uh, giving a um, scientific seal uh, at this administrative uh, process so it was really interesting in bringing the conversation elsewhere elsewhere 
there and giving uh, credibility. Uh, so globally, a very good reaction, and I would say support. What we were feeling is they were proud uh, to see our move. They were standing uh, standing up by the arrogance of publishers. And what it was really interesting is that some of them have been really active. Um, students um, wrote to uh, Springer, for example. They wrote a letter to Springer. Our uh, rector or university president, he wrote to the CEO of Wiley. Uh, and uh, some of the faculty uh, wrote also to commercial publishers to, to, to tell them their intention not to publish, not to translate, not to review, not to participate to, to any of their publishing process. So for us, it was a... <laughs> It was the result of a good uh, understanding of uh, what we were doing. That was, and I would say, uh, when the faculty were writing to publisher, the phone rang in my my office at that time. Not necessarily when our principal wrote. So <laughs> it was interesting. So, so I would say a pretty good understanding, but a lot of work in communication plans. So. Thanks uh, so much, Stephanie. That's incredible uh, about the students writing. Uh, and also separately, just bless people doing the reactions. Like, it's so helpful. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, I know MIT sort of has a, a bit of a different path here. That I hope this will answer one of the first questions to come in about what's the difference between unbundling and going out of contract, right? Unbundling, you know, being, you know, breaking up a big deal, but, you know, resubscribe or, you know, breaking up a big deal, but resubscribing to maybe a core number of titles or having some sort of a contract with the publisher versus, you know, going completely out of contract and having no subscription, you know, no contract at all with that, that publisher, which I know, as you said, MIT is done with, with Elsevier, uh, you know, which is a bit of a different thing to manage and you know, manage, I would imagine. Um, so it'd be great if you could share, you know, sort of MIT's experience and sort of uh, managing faculty's uh, reaction and supporting them through this. Yeah, um, so much to say about this. Um, you know, the, first, the good news, the bottom line up front, like we kept track of reactions, like either emails that we got or uh, actually Aaron's team did an amazing job together with our communications folks of tracking tweets about our announcement. Um, yeah, so we, so we kept track of the feedback that we were receiving and in analyzing it, here's bottom line up front, 10 to one positive. So that's, you know, a bit of the story that we like to tell. Um, and it's remained, I don't think we've gotten a negative, uh, any negative feedback about being out of contract with Elsevier in well over a year, I think. Um, at least nothing that's risen to my level. So, um, and, uh, you know, some of, I, I think Anne's point about PR matters is, is so important. We had um, both the MIT news team, uh, you know, folks in the libraries who work on communication, um, together with some key faculty allies and the then um, chair of the faculty committee on the libraries. Um, we were putting out statements and news articles right and left about why we did this. Um, and so that sort of, you know, there was a, an, a, a way of sort of going on the offense um, instead of having to defend ourselves against faculty concerns. Um, and I mean, we'll get to this a little bit later. I mean, honestly, the the main concerns that we had were about speed of of um, access because we did have um, the deals we had signed pr previously with Elsevier all included perpetual access. So it was just speed of access to new things published from June 2020 afterwards. Um, and I'm going to let Aaron during another section talk about it, how we solved that problem. Um, but I, I want to like, there was one tweet that had always stayed with me. So if folks will let me read it. <laughs> um, this was not long after we had gone out of contract. A graduate student uh, at MIT tweeted this. I was mildly annoyed for being paid wall paywalled at molecular cell due to MIT canceling the Elsevier contract. But then I remembered that I 100% support this decision by the libraries. I mean, you can't ask for better, right? Like, so, and and that was somewhat typical. Um, and again, it was it, all because of the faculty and the library staff who did the hard work of um, really, you know, educating and explaining why we why we wanted to stick by our principles in negotiating a contract that would allow our authors 
to maintain their own rights to their own work and be able to follow the the policies that the institution has. Um, there was there was a real sort of almost dull logic to that, if you will. That's not an official term. Um, so anyway, can I j j jump in for a second? Is that okay, Nick? Um, Please. Just to add that I think our market interest, it's super interesting to listen to y'all because I think our, in some ways there's much similarity and in some ways our marketing strategy was slightly different. So to put this out there, as Chris said, because we were taking this sort of principled argument, we act, our marketing strategy also included the fact that we were taking, or not we, the libraries, but in not being able to successfully get Elsevier to move, they were losing access to content, right? So it was less about making it you know, immediately accessible. It was like, we're taking, we're, for these reasons, you no longer have access to Elsevier content. And we had to explain that. And like Anne said, um, I would just echo that too, that we had a, we had some vocal opposition, um, but it was a very small number of, uh, of people. And so I also think like it was hard, particularly when it was happening, um, and particularly for our frontline staff to rem to put that in perspective <laughs> and yeah. to remember it's a very small number of people with um, strong opinions and many, many, many other people also <laughs> were aligned with that that tweet that that put out that Chris that Chris just read. So thinking a little bit about how to put the feedback in perspective, um, I think was also an important lesson uh, as we went through this process. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in one other thing. The other thing that helped us was um, when we did have uh, faculty who, who had, you know, real gripes about it, um, we were often able to leverage our faculty colleagues who were in their department, in their discipline, who could talk to them person to person and say, I, too, rely on these journals. And it's also a pain for me, but here's why I support it instead of just a librarian talking about principles. This was, you know, we could get, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm a big fan of librarians talking about principles. Um, but but we had some faculty who were, who were willing to really get in the trenches and have those conversations. Thanks so much, Chris and Aaron. And I think you sort of building on this theme of, uh, uh, you sort of making this as easy as possible for faculty, you know, to navigate the change in access um, program. I know that was a hallmark of Bucknell's, uh, you know, success, um, you know, and sort of your quick response times for getting faculty access to articles uh, you know, after the decision um, to move away from the big deal. Um, so it'd be great to, to round out this section just by hearing a little bit more about your experience and sort of giving faculty, you know, confidence that, you know, they weren't losing access. It was just going to be arranged in a different way or even to what you said, they might actually be gaining access to more materials than they had otherwise. Yeah, uh, so I, I think um, a lot of my colleagues touched on this, but I think the, one of the important things that we always need to keep in mind is always answer the question, why? Because a lot of times we kind of go to the end result without kind of defining the process and 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 the why. So, in our case, that was kind of the most uh, the hallmark of why we're doing this was front and center of every conversation. Um, the other thing that I uh, said in in uh, Acha when we I formed the collection development task force committee, um, one of the first things I said at the meeting was. We need to make sure we're not doing this to faculty, but we're doing it with faculty. And um, and I think that was important because we made them part of the process. And if they felt it, and 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 this happened uh, over a year, and 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 at every conversation, they we kind of listened to them. Uh, a chair of our faculty committee presented at faculty meetings, and he was the one who was presenting, not me. So faculty, we're hearing from faculty about what was going on, and, or just giving an update on where we were in the process. So, it, so it wasn't that we announced it and then we did it. A lot of things were happening. We held uh, open houses in the library. Uh, we were on the agenda for the faculty meetings. We attended um, uh, the college meetings, uh, department chairs meetings. So we have we had a whole change management plan in place as to how we're gonna kind of address this. Um, and I think that really kind of helped at the end of the day. It, it um, I mean, I joke around now, but we were all nervous about the day this change happened, what's gonna happen? And it was a non-event. 
And and it was a non-event because of all the things we had been doing for the past year. Um, and uh, so I think that's kind of an important perspective to keep in mind is because a lot of time we kind of want to get to the end result, but kind of neglect the process uh, and and the community engagement um, in the mix. Um, so, and in our case, I think we had a really strong project manager who was keeping us on track um, and and saying, okay, here are the things we need to do. And, um, and here are all the meetings that happen. And here is what we owe to the campus community on, on this day. So like we were, had a really forward looking plan in place and, and she kept us on track, and if uh, I didn't do something, she walked into my office and told me so. That I had to hear the things that I, I needed to do. So I think that's really uh, an important element um, for us in, in, in the statement that I kind of said at the beginning of my remarks was, we were not going to do it to faculty, we're going to do it with faculty. Thanks so much. and. You know, one question I just want to pull out right here um, that uh, someone raised was, you know, for institutions with subject librarians, what role did they play? Um, and I just want to address that quickly before sort of moving off, because I think, you know, how different institutions structure managing faculty reaction, doing faculty outreach could be really helpful for folks. Um, and so, you know, would love to just quickly go around and hear, you know, for, you know, any of you all, uh, any of, for any of the panelists, um, you know, if subject librarians were involved, you know, or if, you know, there's anything that you'd share just about sort of how this work was structured within the library briefly. Yeah, Anne. So um, we use subject librarians only to share information with their, the folks that they liaise with. So if they, we asked people to um, be available to answer questions, but um, uh, I will say that the only population that really struggled with this project was internally in the library, many of them subject librarians who just couldn't wrap their brain around the fact that we weren't doing title by title, that we weren't giving faculty an option to weigh in on which titles to um, uh, to resubscribe to or whatever. And But we really just gave them the role of being information conduits about the project and about the effect that it would have. And we also asked them to be ambassadors. Um, and that was mixed. It was um, That's a very honest answer, but it really was not a cancellation project. And that was hard for internal people to get their minds around. It was just changing the way that we pay for what people need. Muted. It had to happen to one of us on uh, this webcast, or otherwise it wouldn't be complete. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Anne. Uh, Aaron. Yeah, we formed us a very small committee, and and like Para mentioned, it was it was the beginning of the pandemic. So pandemic, you know, March, April, May, we ended our subscription with Elsevier in June. So we did not actually have a big complex project management cycle. We were all running on, everybody was running on fumes. So we formed a small committee that did include a um, subject uh, that included folks from our, our liaison um, area. And we, uh, we they're doing much the same thing sort of in the communication role. Um, we put together talking points for the liaisons and we did, we've done that several times um, along the way because, um, We've, we've been in a few waves of negotiations with, with Elsevier over the years. So, you know, the reason that we didn't resubscribe, the reason that we didn't resubscribe, you know, or we come, come to a transformative agreement. Um, so we developed some talking points um, for the communication process. The um, subject librarians, um, some of them um, were exceptionally helpful in being the mediator and communicating with, uh, with their faculty. Um, which was amazing and wonderful. Some of them needed a little bit more support in that, you know, endeavor. And so the scholarly communications team tried to provide support in that endeavor. And we had a sort of an escalation protocol up to Chris if, you know, people were feeling like they were not getting resolution. Very few of them needed to go up to that level. Um, but we did try to provide support. And I think, you know, had we had more time, I think we would have been able to do that more comprehensively and better. And that's a recommendation that I might give to others. Um, I also just want to note, I know the subject liaisons were specifically mentioned, but I also just want to 
point out the, the, the circulation staff and the interlibrary loan staff are also the front are also very much the front line. And unlike the subject liaisons, they don't have enough background um, to be really able to defend the, you know, the decision of the library or explain the decision, explain the decision of the library, right? Um, and so that's another place, you know, I think we we did we did well in the situation that we were in. Um, had could we do it if we were to do it again? I, you know, I think we would think a little bit about making sure that um, that any, you know, that that all of our frontline staff are able to talk to our users. So, uh, I'll just kind of jump into. In our case, actually, we had I had one of the uh, subject librarians co co chair the committee with our scholarly communications officer. So they were part of the process, and then their uh, one of their roles was to kind of take this back to the peers and talk to them about uh, and keeping them engaged throughout the process. So. So I think that uh, format uh, worked really well. I just want to go back to uh, one other thing that uh, I want to kind of really highlight. Uh, early on in the conversation, when we started to talk to our faculty committee about this, we actually brought Nick and uh, from Spark to come talk to the committee to have an outside perspective. And I think that really helped them because they were not just hearing that from us, but from from experts out uh, who are dealing uh, working on this at a at a at a scale uh, throughout with institutions throughout the country, so I think that was a really also important element about because they don't do this on a daily basis, right? I mean, they, I can send them ten articles, they're not going to read it. But having uh, Nick come to actually a committee meeting and and talk to what's happening uh, at the national level and uh, and that was really I think a, a an important and a and a critical time for focus for the faculty to really kind of okay yeah we're not the only ones doing this so uh, and and this is um, how others have done it in the past and this is uh, how we can kind of move forward with this project so I just want to thank Nick for kind of being part of that process as well. Go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, I have something to say uh, in response to Parliament's being uh, way too kind, uh, but would love to hear your answer on the subject li liaison uh, librarian, uh, uh, excuse me, subject librarian question first. I was just going to add the, the, the role of, of uh, Alliance and Librarian in, in our uh, university. They, they, they were always uh, uh, also um, ambassadors so a communication role but also as we uh, we were in a title by title selection they had the final word uh, so the selection have been done with through the analysis of, of very important data but but also at, at the end it was really the the, the mediation role or the last uh, last call uh, <laughs> is there something and is there some very few title you you would add or 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 would would withdraw and they, they had this role, but it was really thin as a role, I, I would say, except by the, this communication uh, they had to do. Thanks, Stephanie. And I think, yeah, as a core theme here, it's really helpful to see the different, the way that different institutional contexts, you know, translates into different strategies, um, you know, here that, that work you know, best for um, individual institutions and, and what that looked like at Montreal. Um, and you know, just to, to Parham's point, um, you know, if you know, we can be helpful, SWARC can be a resource, um, you know, for institutions that are planning to unbundle, and it's helpful to have that kind of an outside presentation. Um, you know, I think you know, these are the kinds of things that, like, for Spark member libraries, yeah, you know, this is exactly the kind of support that we want to be providing. So please don't be shy um, about reaching out if we can be helpful in that way. Um, you know, I also think with the growing experience related to unbundling there's probably a lot of knowledge in the community that can you know play a similar role um you know but to the extent that it's hap you know helpful to have an organization like spark speak to like that kind of a group um you know that those are ways we love to to support members so please do uh, reach out if we can be be helpful there you know already unsurprisingly um you know sort of how each of you has provided sort of continuity of access has already come up and what we've talked about already come up a bunch in the questions uh, in the chat, unsurprisingly. Um, and I think it's one of the things that I'm most excited to be able to unpack a little bit more here um, and build on the profiles. 
Um, you know, so I know somehow we're already um, two thirds of the way through this session, um, but, you know, would love to just quickly go around and hear, um, you know, briefly, you know, sort of how each of you approached, um, you know, providing access in lieu of a big deal um, and sort of, you know, what decisions you made at, you know, sort of which points. Um, and I think we might unpack this a little bit more after the first round, but, you know, just quickly going around to hear, you know, how you all um, provided access outside of a big deal um, would be would be great. Um, so uh, <laughs> uh, maybe we can go in backwards order that we just uh, did the last question. Stephanie, if you want to start, if you don't mind. I'll be very fast because it's so <laughs> long ago. <laughs> there are new sources. And <laughs> but our uh, interlibrary loan had a fee. So we we freed that first. Uh, we we bought a journal article archive, and also we promote uh, OA article that were available uh, through um, on paywall apps that we install uh, in library PC. Though that are the three main uh, measures that have been uh, put for us. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Par. So for us, uh, that was a really important element because we didn't know. Um, how much request we're going to get, right? That was a big unknown. So before we even um, unbundled, I created a, a, a one-year position for ILA, uh, interlibrary loan. I said, okay, this is going to be dedicated to kind of be, kind of dealing with some of the unknowns that are going to come. Um, and I think that uh, was really comforting to the faculty, that we are actually not just saying it, we're putting resources behind supporting them. Um, and Actually, a year after that, uh, that position was no longer needed. We we transitioned that uh, role into uh, a permanent role, but uh, in a, in a different way. But I think it kind of just showed that we were just we had a plan in place that the day we turn the switch off, we have we putting the infrastructure in place to support our faculty and students. Thanks, uh, Aaron. Do you want to speak to that MIT's experience? Sure. So we, again, we were sort of, we were trying to make the point that Elsevier was not cooperative and we could not come to an agreement because they were not cooperative. And so we did not initially uh, have an alternative access plan for beyond standard interlibrary loan. We did, um, as Stephanie just mentioned, we sort of, we encouraged on paywall, we encouraged, we, we put together a website that talked, that gave folks tips on how to find o, OA articles in open access repositories. And we sort of made the point that Elsevier is making this difficult for you. And this will be, you know, to some extent, this will now be difficult for you. Um, and then we started getting complaints about turnaround of interlibrary loans. So I should say that um, MIT also uses Rapid. So our turnaround, Rapid ILL, our turnaround was, you know, somewhere between hours and, you know, a day, like rapid turnaround for ILL. Rapid ILL is great. It's fabulous too. Um, but we were hearing from that small vocal, those, that small number of very vocal faculty that waiting an hour or two hours was not um, was not sufficient. So, um, so like UConn, we're now using Reprints Desk. About eighteen months later, uh, we decided to uh, to get commercial document delivery. So we're using Reprints Desk and Article Galaxy. Um, the costs have come nowhere near um, the costs, you know, the costs of our our previous subscription or what we with a proposal that we got for a transformative agreement. Um, we uh, it's completely unmediated, so it's taking no staff time or effort. There was, you know, some setup, but once we got through the setup, we decided in like December of twenty one that we were going to do this. We were up for the beginning of the semester, and you know, in January of uh, of twenty two. So it took you know a couple weeks of evaluation, setup, and testing. But it's completely unmediated. We're providing access uh, to faculty, staff, and students alike. You know, there's no anybody who puts in a request to gets their request filled. Um, and uh, we're really that, that has reduced our complaints uh, to, on turnaround to near to near, to near zero. Um, I will say that Chris and I have some friendly disagreement about whether or not we should have done that from the get-go or whether we should have waited 18 months. Um, you know, I, I came into MIT, I started at MIT in May of 2020, and I come from a technical services background, which is very focused. Has all, my, my entire career has been focused on how do we get everybody, everything they need as fast as they can. So, you know, I came with that, that, that kind of background. Um, I certainly understand that for many organizations, you need to have a plan in place like that. Um, Chris makes a very compelling argument that um, we gave, so I'm very compelled by her argument that 
um, we were, that we demonstrated the responsiveness to the community. They told us that ILL is not fast enough. We solved we solved that problem for them, and um, and therefore we have built up other credibility um, throughout the institute uh, for you know for demonstrating uh, demonstrating responsiveness. And I'm happy to you know if there's further Q and A at the end, we can talk a little bit. We get lots of questions about our article Galaxy reprints test setup, so we can talk about that more in depth with specific questions. And I'll also put it out there that MIT, we, at, we at MIT are very happy to talk to individual libraries contemplating this um, and talking about um, you know, what has worked for us and what we recommend. So, and I see Anne saying the same thing. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Our Spalcom folks are happy to talk to anybody. Our interlibrary loan folks are happy to talk to anyone, um, but it's been very low. It's not, it's not at all staff intensive besides you know managing the budget and paying attention to the tracking of it there's no uh, there's no mediation in day-to-day -day workflows so if I can jump in really really quick to um, <laughs> to expand a little bit on my uh, my uh, support for us having waited to implement a faster uh, delivery system until after we'd gotten some set of complaints is tactically, um, it meant that we did have, like, you know, if we got some complaints, we could respond. If we started with the most responsive and the quickest version of access that we could possibly give them, which is, I think, what we have now, then if we got complaints about that, which, you know, some we, we have heard from some that seconds is too long. Um, but if we had started there, we would have nowhere to go except to resubscribe. And so this way we had, a, you know, we all, oh, we heard you, it hurt, it hurt more than, you know, is acceptable. So, you know, we can go with this one. Um, so there, there was a, a shrewdness to the tactics there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> totally, totally get that. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to throw in was just to throw in a little bit more data. 90, uh, so 92% uh, of our articles come within a minute and mentioned three seconds. I, I, so that's within the minute. Um, and 97% of them arrive within an hour. So um, we, uh, and I think, I think, Anne, you may have said this earlier too, like it's really hard, even if we have faculty complaining now, it's really hard to say um, that there's, you know, that you that you can't wait a minute, and that that savings of two point five million dollars a year is not worth the the. Is worth a couple of basically yes, a couple of seconds right. less friction. But it's been helpful in that way too. I think I'm the only one left on this. So yeah, actually one of the requirements of the Future of Journals Committee was that that be seamless, that the project had to be ready to go and perfect before we actually rolled it out. So we, uh, after the internal committee, I charged them with either we'll hire uh, programmers to create a, a seamless uh, uh, interface and get people what they need when they need it, or we'll find somebody to do that for us. And so we found, um, Reprints Desk, which is Article Galaxy Scholar, and we insisted on single sign-on. And so we actually worked with them very closely for six to nine months as they implemented single sign-on and held off on turning it on until that was ready to go, given that that's what the committee had asked us to do, to do this project. So we really tried to stay true to what we promised them. Uh, we also held off for a year on Elsevier. The provost gave us a million bucks for one year only to keep subscribing to Elsevier as we worked out the kinks with Elsevier. But I will say, you, uh, many of us know that publishers will give like a three month buffer period between when you end your contract and when they actually turn off access. So we ended Elsevier in December, I think it was 23, and they turned off access January 1 and didn't tell us. And so we had to do some scrambling. Luckily, AGS, Article Galaxy Scholar, has tons of great information. And so um, we were able to track the number out of like 1,500 articles, 12 did not arrive um, within an hour. Um, so, you know, it was like, whatever, we've got the stats. At first, we were like, oh, no, we need to get this information out there. We thought we would have time to let people know. No, we had to do it right away, but that was the only glitch. But I would say um, that was a requirement of the committee. I totally support Chris's approach on that. 
It's like help people understand the reality of what this actually means um, to the work that you do. And I'm I I'm very much in support of that. But as I said, we wanted to to really honor what what they did for us. That committee was so great. All right, I am strategizing how we're gonna to get to all these questions in the next 21 minutes, uh, lightning rounds, uh, I think. Uh, unsurprisingly, one of the things that's come up in uh, the questions that we're also planning to touch on relates to, to savings. One of the you know, sort of earlier questions to come in, uh, you know, with someone saying that they're at a relatively small school using zero-based budgeting. So how did, you know, uh, uh, those who made this change project demand um, and budget for document delivery? Um, you know, and so I'd sort of like to kind of combine these questions of, you know, it'd be, you know, wonderful for you all just to sort of speak a little bit more to, you know, the savings that, you know, that the net savings that you realize and sort of what the trajectory has been, uh, over, over time, um, but also how you prepared in the way that the, um, this, you know, questioner was, was asking and sort of, you know, projecting those savings and, um, you know, whether they were real, you know, sort of at the beginning of the process or only became real, you know, six months, a year in. Anybody want to jump on that one first? So, um, yeah, I mean, the savings are real, right? And um, I know, um, and they stayed with, within the library. So it wasn't that they, we didn't ship them back to the university. So I think that helped us kind of plan for projects, but also helped us kind of undertake some, some uh, different initiatives uh, focused on the academics and faculty and students. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the fears that a lot of folks have is, okay, if, if we do this and, and have these um, substantial savings, is that going to money going to go back to the university and then why are we even doing this? So I think that's a conversation that I would encourage you to have with your CFOs before you kind of do, uh, take this process and have a clear understanding uh, and a clear plan in place that this is, um, uh, you're doing this um, uh, not to kind of ship this back to the university budget, but um, hopefully that you can keep it within your libraries and, and reinvest it in, in ways that kind of meet, meet today's and tomorrow's needs. Yeah, and I think you're about to jump in. Yeah, what was the question again exactly? Remind me. Sorry. Fair, it became sprawling there. Uh, well, I was uh, answering just, one one of the things online, so. Yeah, if you could just sort of speak to, uh, you know, the, the savings that UConn realized, uh, you know, sort of whether they sort of became real to the library immediately when you made the decision or only, you know, over time. And then uh, uh, a participant and asked a question about, uh um, you know, sort of how you projected demand, uh, you know, for, you know, for the cost associated with ILL document delivery, um, you know, into the future. Right. Um, so, of course, we didn't realize anything immediately because there was a lot of setup time and we did do it over time as our contracts ended. That's when we did the negotiation with the publisher. So I think we've done like two, one or two every year of the big bundles. Um, Elsevier had a whole year, actually two years all to itself. So it was very slow, but the cost realization, I, I have a chart um, and we are in year five and we've gone from four and a half million to two and a half million in our journal spend. Um, how we predicted, I actually used the data and information from the um, uh, UC system uh, Elsevier project when they, you know, just kind of extrapolating from how much they were spending on articles per campus to provide that. I just extrapolated based on number of faculty, number of ILLs, number of titles, um, and we found a number that way. But that's that's the data that we used and the data that we shared with um, our faculty. And it's been pretty close. I mean, we did give it a big margin, 150 to 300K within the first year. And the first year we were at 100 something, and now we're close to 300. But we've also done a lot more of the of the um, ending the contract. So I'll stop there. So I'll jump in. Um, so uh, at MIT, again, finances weren't the driver for us. Um, so we knew when we canceled our contract, it was uh, what about a 2.7 million a year contract 
um, and uh, we we sort of walled off that money and it's you know called it the Elsevier savings bucket to keep track of it um, to see if we would need to use it for um, IL you know special IL or whatever. Um, eventually, when we did um, contract with reprints desk and then pay per article um, behind the scenes in the first year. I think we saved almost 90%. It was about 300,000 total. Um, and uh, I think in the second year, of course it's going up because there's more content that's been published that we don't have access to, um, but it's not going up. It's certainly not, I think it's about 400,000 this year, right? So substantial, substantial savings. I mean, the the story, you know, basically the bottom line here is the old deals, even the title by title deals that we used to sign did not provide economies of scale because we were buying stuff that nobody read. We knew that with our print books, we know that we have tons of books on our shelves that nobody reads. People, you know, we're, we were buying way more than we needed at way higher of a cost. So, I, you know, there's, there's substantial savings to be had. Um, we are looking and working with um, the administration here, with uh, some other values aligned organizations and folks across the US and elsewhere, um, and some of our own faculty to try and develop plans for how we might reinvest those savings into something that would uh, advance the same principles that caused us to walk away. We're actually, again, since we didn't do it out of budget concerns, we're not super, you know, we're not really um, uh, wedded to the idea that we would funnel it back into some other library operation. Um, it's more about let's, if we're, you know, we did this on principle, let's use the savings to advance those same principles. So the, the, I'll just kind of add a, a different twist to this conversation. So after we did the Elsevier, so we were going to the other big deals. Um, so we, we were using Unsub and really kind of making data informed decisions on how we're going to do this. So um, I'm not going to name names, but there was another big deal that we went with, and we said, okay, we're going to we, we found similar savings that we're going to cut. Um, and we when we when we back went back to them, they kind of just gave us a, a over 25 percent discount because and let us keep what we had. Because and and so I think you can kind of use this this formula to kind of negotiate in other ways, um, and because they know that you've already done this and you're serious about it, um, and and that kind of helps with um, other negotiations as you're going through the process every year. I just want to add. Stephanie, to oh, I, so, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I just saw Stephanie and she came on you earlier and wanted to I'll toss do, her in the end. Come back to you. Okay. I'll, I'll be really rapid. Uh, we, we we saved one million dollar, uh, but uh, the the saving melt in the sun with the years. <laughs> that, that's true. So at that time, as we are in title by title selection, uh, we have been able to um, to lower the the the, the cost of, of subscription, and then we went back in in the subscription, uh, but with the very lower price. So so we rewrite the historical pricing we had with those uh, publisher, and today we are in a situation uh, with uh, in transform transformative agreements and that type of, of big deals number uh, number two, that will might be another session, a complete session, uh, thinking about the impact of those big deals. So what I would say is we are about to face the same crisis or very difficult situation. So hearing my colleagues is really inspiring. <laughs> my director of, of collection is, is creaky at the other side of, <laughs> of the phone, but 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 really we, we will have to do something because what we are doing in reinvestment we're putting putting money in OA uh, initiatives, 2.5% uh, of our acquisition budget. 
and we are uh, we are trying to find a, an interesting model, and we're we're work, working in the province of Quebec, where I'm from, in in Canada. Uh, we are working heavily. Uh, we're involved in a, in a Diamond OA um, uh, initiative with uh, that have been funded by by the province of Quebec. Uh, so for five years, we're building an infrastructure with Erudi, with PKP, with uh, the 18, uh, 18 libraries of the uh, university libraries of the province of Quebec with journals from the province of Quebec. So we're trying to build something. So the energy I want to put is there, <laughs> trying to build an alternative. But I know we won't have choice but to attack again uh, those those deals and to withdraw ourselves or or. We will see how we will manage it, but we, we want to uh, just work on uh, other type of so so solution uh, that are really important. Also, because as you can hear, I am a French speaker, so we have this French literature, uh, scientific literature, local literature, uh, scientific literature that we have to, to protect and to promote and, and, and all the literature, scientific literature, but there is very, something very specific that have been to, to be protected and, and promoted. So, so it, it's, not easy even 10 years after we will you it, it's a continuing process i would i would say to end it i just want to say i put this in the chat um we also spent a significant amount of one-time money which we have because we had a lot of sa uh, staff turnover a significant amount in buying back files so that that decreases the amount of articles that you have to get um uh one on one um and that was huge and then um i'm trying to think of what the other thing i said um so buying art uh the other thing article galaxy scholar preferences open access articles so it will provide the open access article first and we've done the uh, analysis and it's anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the total articles so you're not actually buying all of those articles. It's actually just finding the open access ones and making them available, which is really, really good. Um, so just wanted to add that in. Yeah, it's so important right now with you know, the OSCP memo on the verge of, um, you know, coming into to force over the, the next year or so. Um, certainly top of mind for for us at Spark. Uh, yeah, Aaron, would love to hear from you. I'm going to pivot quickly to exactly. reinvestment. Yeah, I was actually going to say exactly that. So, um, so at MIT, we had we had, and I think Chris mentioned perpetual access to Elsevier. So we only lost, you know, we we still had access to our pre twenty twenty content, but we do, we have been looking at our reprint desk data to see what people, what years of publication people are requesting. So fifty percent in the last year, fifty percent of the requests were for content published this year. 25% was content published one year ago, and the other 25 was like the year before that or the year before that. We don't have extensive longitudinal data, so take that for what it's worth. But what people are requesting is current content. So yes, being on the Spark call, I want to say that we're really hopeful that with the OSTP memo, that um, more current content is going to become open access without embargo by default. And then that will actually fill a significant amount, those numbers that, that Anne just shared about the, the 30 to 40%, you know, we're hoping that number will go up. Um, and then uh, and then that will level out the cost. So the costs are increasing year over year, the one more in contract, out of contract, but we're also hoping that that will get mediated or mitigated by, the, by more open access content being put forth out immediately. And I think that also addresses a question that I saw in the Q and A. There are a couple of questions in the Q and A about, um, you know, aren't the article costs just going to spike? And that is a possibility. That is absolutely a possibility that the article costs could just spike. Um, so we still need we still need more open access content to be put out in the world. This doesn't solve for that problem. We're working on that. You know, we feel like we're working on that problem too. And we obviously really appreciate Sparks. Uh, work in that in that area. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, so I know now only have seven minutes left, uh, but reinvestment has come up quite a few times. It's also something that we wanted to touch on. So, um, you know, I, I think it would be really helpful for folks to hear, you know, just again, briefly, 
you know, sort of how each of you are, you know, sort of thinking about deploying your savings. I know that's already sort of been touched on, but you know, I'm just to tie this to another thing that has come up in a, a number of questions and uh, that have been submitted, um, you know, have, have sort of raised, um, you know, sort of how your decision to unbundle or go out of contract, um, you know, relates to your thinking about various types of open access agreements that you might um, enter into, like read and publish agreements or other, you know, open access agreements. So, you know, I'd love to just quickly go around to sort of, um, you know, learn a little bit more from each of you about, you know, sort of whether there's a reinvestment component to your savings. Um, uh, you know, and this other question is sort of how this work sits with other types of, um, you know, other strategies um, like, uh, you know, open access agreements. Anyone want to jump in first there? I'll jump in on the transformative agreement, read and publish kind of agreements. Um, and Aaron will correct me because I'll get something wrong. Um, but <laughs> I, I think one one piece of our story that we haven't told yet is that two years in, so in, in summer of 2022, Elsevier actually came back to us and said, are you sure? Don't you want to talk again? Um, maybe that's the part that we wouldn't want on the recording. Sorry, that was a little snarky. Um, <laughs> so we did talk to them again. We we reiterated the principles. We whittled down some of the principles and said which ones were super important to us. And bottom line, they came back and we told them we were very clear with them that we weren't interested in a standard read and publish deal. Um, part, some of the other principles of the MIT framework have to do with equity in the system. And we think it's really as important that everyone has access to read without economic barriers, that people have access to participate in the scholarly conversation and to publish their work without unnecessary active, uh, uh, the monetary barriers. Um, and uh, so we told them, we don't, you know, that's just not going to work for us. And what they came back with was a, their basic standard read and publish deal and pages and pages of why it was a good deal. And we said no again. Um, do we have some read and publish deals with other uh, vendors? Yes, we do. Um, you know, I'd be I'd be lying if I said we haven't signed some. Um, we have signed some that move toward that that move towards the framework that show good faith in understanding what we're asking for and, and providing some transparency around cost, for example, um, and other concessions around um, uh, open access policy waivers and things like that. Um, but it, on, the, on the issue of transformative agreements, a standard read and publish deal um, it not only is not um, aligned with the principles that MIT wants to stand for, but also we've done the analysis there as well. And bulk, bulk payments by libraries for APCs also gives no economies of scale to an institution. It actually costs more because they price it at the highest possible average and they put these ceilings on the in the deals and they're just not good deals from our analysis. So that's not the reinvestment, but I think I already talked about what we're doing around that, that we're working to find a way to reinvest our money um, to advance our principles. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Chris. Anyone else want to jump in to build on Chris's point? About transformative agreement of saving or saving savings, transformative agreements? Both, yeah. <laughs> what I would what I want I would say is uh, here in Quebec and, and and probably in Canada also we are going to uh, not reconsider but but think about the impacts of those transformative agreement uh, about the the accessibility the the the, diff the equity of access same thing than than Chris said a few uh, uh, minutes ago uh, and, and we we just look at Plan S in in Europe and they are going to uh, leave those. Types Type of agreement we should Sweden have done the same thing uh, a lot of European countries are considering to to leave that type of, of initiative so why should would we continue that uh, I think and, and plan S has documented uh, pretty interesting results about those tra transformative agreement that they began in, in 2018 in Canada we began a little bit later so we have, uh, I would say, two, two, three years of experiences. So all I would say is we should be inspired in, in that area by, by the European and look at what they are doing and why they, it's pre pretty well documented. So uh, we are going to, to consider going out or, or work, not, not 
and, and I don't think that transformative agreement transform anything. So <laughs> consider that we have to to find a, a plan S, a plan a plan uh, T <laughs> to to keep on continuing with that. Thanks so much. Uh, Anna Parham, uh, I know we're running right up to the the end, but uh, want to make space if uh, there's anything else that you all would like to share in response to, to this point. No, I, I think uh, so. Bucknell has um, an open access policy since 2011 um, for faculty, and um, and so we are kind of looking at ways now uh, from the savings that we've had, how do we kind of reinvest that um, in really open access initiatives on campus. So so that is um, on, on our list. Um, I, I don't really kind of be not at a place where we, I can say we've done these uh, things, but that is one of the re reinvestment strategies that, that we have in place because um, uh, open access is, um, we promote it with our faculty. We have a, a policy for, um, like I said, we were, one of the first small uh, liberal arts institution to adopt a, a policy that the faculty, actually the faculty adopted. Uh, and so uh, I, I think there's a lot more work to get be done on that front. Well, I think connecting uh, this work to an institutional open access policy is uh, a good way uh, to, to start to come to a close. And I also uh, uh, just want to respond, you know, there's a great question in the chat, which we didn't have time to, to address about, you know, sort of, is there any discussion about libraries being the keepers of the scholarly record and what canceling journal means in that context? Um, you know, I think, yeah, as Aaron said, I think we could have a whole discussion on that, but I'd say, you know, from my perspective, you know, I hope what this does is help to move towards an ultimately more sustainable scholarly publishing ecosystem that has, um, you know, library publishers, has, you know, community government infrastructure that's really at the core, and that that's what, you know, sort of libraries being the keeper of the scholarly record in an open environment um, looks like. Um, I wish we had time to go back around to respond to that question, because uh, I think it's such a, an interesting one, but I really appreciate, um, you know, the panelists taking the time um, to to join us. And I also want to flag when this session closes, there will be a survey that's, you know, not only like how the session was, but there are two questions there. Um, one's asking for feedback, if there's, you know, anything else that you would find helpful in either considering, um, you know, leaving a big deal or considering investments um, in some of the open initiatives that we've discussed, you, know, you can share your email address so we can follow up with you there um, uh, you know, for those resources. And also, if you have any suggestions, uh, there'll be a, a place where you can can add those. So your responses to the survey would be, be really helpful. Um, so thank you all so much. Uh, thanks for bearing with us trying to sprint through all the things. I think we got to about half of what the speaker is prepared for. Uh, so thank you for all the preparation, some of which we got to. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot that could come out of this, um, including the uh, strategic priorities working group of our negotiations community of practices interested in having a follow-up discussion, um, building on the forum, um, you know, particularly around the sort of reinvestment um, of savings component of this. Um, so be on the lookout for uh, more on that uh, coming in the near future. Uh, so again, just want to thank our fantastic speakers once again, uh, and thank you all so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Take care, everybody.